All right, welcome everybody. This is the final breakout session of Tulsa Tech Fest. You have arrived. And we thank you all for coming, and I hope you all go by and visit uh, sponsors of Tulsa Tech Fest, and uh, they made it all happen. Uh, we wouldn't be here without them, so I uh, appreciate what they've, um, what they've done to help out. Uh, this talk is on basic electronics uh, and microcontroller programming with Arduino. We are going to cover a lot of ground today. So um, anyway, this is uh, what I call uh, an EE degree in 75 minutes or less. So anyway, the, uh, I, I time myself. I can do it in 71 minutes. So we'll, we'll, we'll see if I can do the same with, with, with other people uh, watching. So um, a little bit about myself. Paul, a lot of you probably don't know me. Uh, my primary job is working as the chief nerd in charge of a company called New Media. Um, and uh, we do a lot of things. Kind of our bread and butter is uh, event management software, uh, but we do a lot of other things too. Um, Co-founder of iStot, they make uh, um, had them out here. They make uh, crash sensors. Um, so if you're in a if you're in a bike uh, in a bike wreck, it'll the crash sensor will go off, tell your phone to notify your friends that you've had an accident. So. Um, I, I'm a director of the Blythe Institute, which is a nonprofit research and education organization. Um, and then I run uh, uh, BP Learning and BP Books, uh, do, do uh, educational publishing. So, um, you know, a, a couple books that I've written. Um, new programmers start here. If you know anyone who wants to get into programming and they don't know anything about programming, that's a great book. Um, it's based on uh, some uh, homeschool classes that I did um, and that I still do. Uh, building scalable web applications using the cloud is about cloud programming. Uh, programming from the ground up is about assembly language programming in Linux. Um, that's the Chinese translation over there. Um, engineering in the ultimate. Um, one, one thing that surprises some people is that my, my actual training is actually in theology. Um, and so this book is on uh, integrating uh, science, technology, engineering, philosophy, and theology. Um, and then politics and the other books as well. So there's a lot of places to find me online. Um, I'm on GitHub. I'm on Facebook. I write for Classical Conversations, which is a national homeschool group. Um, also, we're starting up the Tulsa, or we're restarting up the Tulsa Open Source Hardware Group. Okay, so if you're interested in hardware, and electronics, and Arduino programming, Raspberry Pi, um, drones, that sort of thing. Um, we're, we are restarting Tulsa Open Source Hardware, and the first meeting is uh, Wednesday, August 24th, um, and it's going to be at 36 degrees north. Uh, we have a Google group right now, and you can, uh, you can see the Google group. Uh, I put a link here. This just redirects to the group. It's bplearning.net slash TOSH. Um, I also started a Twitter account at Hardware Tulsa. So... Um, hmm. All right, so here's what we're doing today. We are gonna, our goal is to learn the basics of electricity. So if you don't know anything about wiring anything at all, that's our goal today, learn the basics of electricity. Learn how to read a schematic, how to wire a breadboard, learn a couple basic circuits that will get you a long way, and then how to combine those into a microcontroller system that we can program from our computer, all right? So we're covering a lot of ground. If you've been in, uh, if you've, if you've been in electronics, you, some of it you already know, but for those of you who don't know, we are going to cover a lot of material. So, starting out, thinking about electricity. Now, one of the things about electricity is that electricity is weird. It's, it does not follow very many of our normal intuitions. And especially for me, I come from a computer programming background. So electronics is very unlike computing. Because in computing, what we try to do is we try to abstract things so that you don't hit reality for a very long time. Okay? So like, for example, um, you know, if, if you think about uh, programming, you've got 32 bit, a 32-bit integer. Well, that means that from, from 0 to 4 billion, you don't have to worry about the physics of those 32 bits. Now, when you hit, if you have a number that goes beyond 4 billion, all of a sudden you have to worry about how many bits you have. But from 0 to 4 billion... It doesn't really matter. Um, however, in electronics, you often you ha you hit reality a lot more often, and so that's one of the ways that where electronics is a lot different 
than programming. Um, so electronics kind of provides a middle ground between straight physics and kind of the way that we logically think of things working. Um, so in electronics, reality matters a lot more than in computer programming. Um, so in, el in electricity, we have some fundamental qual quantities that we always deal with. Now, the first one we actually, uh, actually isn't dealt with a lot, but it's what others are based on. That is charge. Charge is how much electrical stuff there is. All right. Now, you can think of it in terms of electrons, but there's other types of electrical stuff than just electrons. So you can think of it as uh, charge being how many electrons are there. Um, and it's measured in coulombs. You can also measure it in milliamp hours. Um, so current is what is the first one that we use on a regular basis. And that's how fast charge is moving past a point. Okay. So um, now one of the things that, um, so it's, it's measured in amperes. And one amper means one coulomb per second. Okay. Now in, in, in microelectronics and doing small stuff like this, we don't deal in amperes directly. We deal in milliamps which is one one thousandth of an amp. Um, so then there's, but, all, but the equations deal in amperes. So you have to oftentimes have to switch back and forth. Then voltage is how much power each coulomb of electricity produces. And we'll get into this, a little bit more intuitive notions of this in a minute. And then resistance is how much the conductor resists the flow of electricity and it's measured in ohms. Now, as I said, electricity is weird so we have to come out with a good analogy for this so we can think about it better, okay? And so one of the best analogies to electricity is water, okay? So you can think of, uh, of the actual physical water itself as being like charge, right? So we have so many coulombs, we have so many liters of water, okay? So, and then if I ask you, how fast is the water current flowing in this river? You might say there's, um, you know, there's a million liters per hour, right? So that's current. How fast in volume this current is, this charge is flowing, okay? Now voltage is a little different. Voltage is how much water pressure, okay? That is, if I were to shoot this water out of a pipe, how far would it go, okay? Because you can have, if you have a squirt gun, there's not much water, but it can go far, right? So it has a lot of voltage, Okay, it's got each each bit of water has a lot of power behind it. Okay, now if you think about, but then think about a giant drain pipe, you know, coming out of a um, coming out of a creek bed or something. There might be a lot of water flowing through it, but it just falls over, right? Because there's not a lot of energy behind it. It just it just falls. So that's voltage is how much power is behind that movement. Okay, so that's uh, that's the way to think about it. And then resistance is how small is the pipe carrying the water. So if it has a lot of resistance, then it's like it being in a small pipe. Okay, so that's kind of the fundamental qual qual quantities. Does anyone have any questions on this before I move on? Okay, so just to go back, charge is how much stuff, current is how fast it's moving, and voltage is how much power is behind that movement, and resistance is how small your pipe is, all right? So then we have circuits. Now current only flows in circuits. Um, and so here we trace the current from the positive. It gets split off into two different locations and comes back to the negative. Okay? <clears throat> and so, um, so this is a schematic. And in a schematic, we have several different components. Okay? And the components are connected by wires. And then you have connection points, which indicate that the wires themselves are connected. Um, you have, um, so a, volt, a battery is a voltage source. That means there is a fixed amount of electrical pressure between the positive and the negative. If it's a five volt battery, that means there's always five volts of pressure going around here. Um, you have a, so you, uh, batteries have a positive terminal and a negative terminal. <coughs> then when you have things that are just one right after another, we call those things being in series with each other. Okay, so just one thing after another. But if it splits off and things are running next to each other, we call that being in parallel. Okay? So you've got components in series, <coughs> components in parallel. Now, as I said, this, this symbol means a battery. 
This symbol means a resistor. Okay, and we'll, we'll do other symbols as we go along. So this is the positive terminal. This terminal has a bunch of different names. Okay, and they all actually have a slightly different meaning, but in battery-oriented DC electronics, they're all the same. You can call it the ground, you can call it the negative, you can call it the, the common. Okay? Those are, those in, in small-scale DC electronics, those all mean the same thing. Okay? Mm -hmm. um, as you do more complicated things, um, you might have the ground and negative be different. But for what we're doing, and for most of Arduino stuff, the ground and the negative and the common, all the same thing. Now, you may have been surprised that I was pointing out that current was flowing from positive to negative. Now, if you just took a basic physics course, teach you that, that electrons flow from negative to positive, and that's true. But think about a vacuum cleaner, all right? If you plug in a vacuum cleaner and you turn it on, now imagine you're an engineer designing the vacuum cleaner. Do you trace first the flow of the dirt into the vacuum, or do you trace the flow of the pull of the vacuum before the dirt? Right? You, if you're an engineer, you start with the pull of the vacuum inside. The fact that dirt moves is interesting, but that's not what we trace as engineers. We trace the actual vacuum, which is we trace the nothing, and then the something follows along. Okay? And so that's why in electronics, and uh, we, we go from even though the, the actual electricity generally flows from negative to positive, we trace the current, which is kind of what's pulling the electrons, from positive to negative. Okay? Um, and this is true of pretty much every circuit diagram ever made. So you always see positive being the source of the current. And it's called conventional current. Um, it's the convention we use when we're marking things. Um, the, uh, so anyway... So even though electrons are moving, the charge that's being traced is the positive charge. Okay. So um, here's basic features of a schematic. Here is a voltage source, also known usually a battery. Okay. Now the other thing to keep in mind is that when we're doing schematics, we often think of these as, as being perfect. But everything in electronics is imperfect. Okay. So when I say that there's a constant voltage between those two things, that it's always 5 volts, well, sometimes that's not true. But we think about, especially in an intro, we're always going to think about these things as if they were their ideal selves. Okay. So a voltage source has positive and negative. Now, there, on a circuit, there are many different places where we might have to connect back to the negative. Okay. And so rather than trying to write all those places where we're connecting back to the negative, what we do is we have this little guy. And that means that guy goes to ground, but I'm not going to draw the wire. Okay? It means connect that guy back to negative, not drawing the wire. On the other side, you might have a line that just says plus 5 volts. Okay? And that means I want that to connect to the positive voltage on the battery, but I don't want to, I don't want to draw the line. Okay? And so that's how you can make a lot cleaner drawings uh, and just everyone knows where that connects to. Okay? As we mentioned, a resistor, this is how many ohms the resistor is. So that's 1,000 ohms. Then you have capacitors, which we're really not going to get into today. What they do is they store a tiny amount of charge. Okay? And they're me measured in farads, or in this case, the U stands for micro, and that's 10 microfarads. Um, and then you have, like, here's a push button. And the reason it looks like this is because uh, you can think of this being a wire that connects the circuit. When someone pushes the button down, that connects the circuit and allows electricity to flow. Um, this guy is an LED. Okay? And so LEDs are, it stands for light emitting diode. Okay? So what does a diode do? A diode allows current to flow in only one direction. So if I were to put the positive here and the negative here, no current would flow because the diode only allows current to go this way. See, the arrow points the way it goes. Okay, so if I put positive here and negative here, I will get current. Um, and so that little line <coughs> means that it's going to block anything trying to come the other way. The little lines coming up inside mean that I'm going to light up. Okay? So that's an LED. We use those all the time. And then you oftentimes have output signals. So if I have a circuit and the... Uh, 
and I, I, I you know, it, we oftentimes to break things up, we'll break them up into modules and say, okay, well, well, this the output of this leads into my circuit. Well, we usually just have a little open circle saying this goes somewhere else. Um, this, you know, if you think about an amplifier, you go to your preamp, and then you go to your power amp, and then it goes to the speaker. Well, if I was just designing the preamp circuit, I'd end it with this little circle, which means I need to connect that to the next stage. So, any questions on those? All right. So here's how you would draw a simple LED circuit. All right. So this is a button-controlled LED. Um, we have positive. It goes through a resistor, and we'll see why that's important in a moment. Um, and then there's a button. And if you don't push the button, electricity doesn't flow. Okay. Once you push the button, then electricity can flow through here, comes through here, lights up the LED, winds up back at the negative. Okay? Simple schematic. This is what this is how we think about circuits. Okay? And so it's it's important because things get really messy once you start putting them on breadboards. So it's important to keep these things nice and clean so that you can think about them better. Okay? So before we get to actually putting things on breadboards, talk a little bit more about theory, okay? And uh, what I like to call the four rules, okay? These are the four rules of an analyzing circuits. And these four rules will help you analyze almost any circuit, okay? So, and we're going to, I'm going to show you these in, in pictures in a moment, but for the moment I'm going to just tell you what they are. So that we have current law. The current law says that at any connection point, the amount of current coming into the connection point equals the amount of current coming out of it, right? So if you think about a four-way stop at, at traffic, the number of cars coming into the traffic stop has to equal the number of cars coming out of the traffic stop, unless we have a black hole or something. You know, so, so that's the current law. And it's just based on the fact that stuff doesn't appear out of nowhere. If stuff comes in to a point, it's also got to come out. So the same amount of stuff that goes in comes out. The voltage law is a little weird, and we'll get to it in, in more depth in a moment. And it says, given any two points on a circuit, even if there's more than one path between those two points, um, the total voltage gain or loss between those two, between every path between those points will be identical. Okay, we'll d we'll talk about this a little bit more later. So Ohm's law. This is the only one with an actual equation attached. But this is a very important equation. So if you're writing things down, this is one to write down. Ohm's law that says if, if I have a circuit, if, if I have a resistor, um, volts equals current times resistance. And we'll show you why that's so important later. Okay, so if I have, if I have so many volts, so if, if I have a resistor of so many uh, ohms, and I have a certain voltage source, I can solve for how much current's flowing through it. If I know how much current is flowing through it, and I know the resistance, I can solve for how much voltage that's, that, that's losing. Okay? And the last one is uh, what, what I call the wiring rule. And that if you have something that's just a bare wire, okay, every single point on that wire can be considered identical. Now that's not entirely true if you get into really complicated circuits, and it's not true if you have really fast circuits, like if you're running a you know, a, a gigahertz ethernet or something like that. But in general, all points of a wire, if there's no components attached to it, you can consider all points of, of a wire equivalent. It doesn't matter where you attach the wires. Um, they're all basically equivalent. Okay? So current law, as I said, it's just like a traffic stop. If I've got current coming in here, that, um, then I've got current coming in, the same amount of current coming out. Okay, so if I have, let's say I have one amp coming in here. Well, the total, uh, so if I measure both of these and add them together, they're going to add up to one amp because that's the total amount of current coming in. The current coming in equals the current going out. And uh, the reason for that is there's no, other, there's no other way to go. The current is the amount of stuff flowing, so it's got to flow somewhere. So if, if I had, if I measured this to be a half amp and this to be a quarter amp coming out, that means coming in here is three quarters of an amp. Okay, so that's just adding them together. All right, so that's the current law. So the voltage law. Let's say we have a circuit that looks like this. Okay, so we've got these two points. Now I can get from this point to this point from a variety of different directions. I can go 
can go through here, I can go straight across, I can go across here, all those different ways, okay? Now, the, the interesting thing is that the voltage law says that no matter how I go, it is the same, I, I use up the same amount of voltage no matter how I go. <clears throat> now, um, the way to think about that, to make it, because that's kind of weird, but it may, the way to make it a lot more sense is to think about voltage kind of like a height, okay? So let's say that, 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 that I'm here, right? I'm on the second floor, and someone else is in the registration area on the first floor, okay? Now, there are a variety of ways that I can get from here to the registration area, right? But the, but the, the, the height difference between here and there is going to be the same no matter what path I take, right? And so even if I go down the stairs and back up the stairs and down the stairs and back up the stairs and down the stairs, the total change in height that I travel has to be the same no matter how weird my path <coughs> is, okay? Because since we're at different heights, if I go from here to there, I'm changing heights, okay? And so this gets a little weirder because these voltages can change during the course of a circuit, but at any particular point in time. So, you know, even if this voltage is changing up and down and up and down, at any given point, the voltage difference between here and here is going to be the same no matter what path I take. The voltage difference itself may change over time, but at any point in time, doesn't matter what path I take, it's always the same difference. Okay? Now, as I said, think of it like a height. You know, I, I can't go uphill to school both ways. Um, there's only, um, there's, there's a fixed height difference um, between any two heights. So, no matter what the path. Um, so, then we have Ohm's Law. Okay? As I said, volts equals, I stands for current, current times resistance. Um, and you can arrange this with basic algebra to, be, uh, to solve for any one of those. Okay? So here's how you think about it. If I have a 9-volt battery and my circuit has 300 ohms, how much current is flowing? Well, current equals volts divided by resistance. Right? So 9 divided by 300 is 0.03 amps. That's how much current is flowing. Okay? So, and, I, and as I said, in DC circuits, we often use milliamps. So that would be uh, 30 milliamps. So multiply that by 1,000 is the conversion from amps to, to milliamps. Okay, so let's, let's, let's use this form. Okay, if I have 0.02 amps passing through a 1 kilo ohm resistor, how much voltage does that resistor eat up? Okay, well, you use the equation. Volts equals current times resistance. I've got 0.02 amps, and I've got 1,000 ohms, so that means that eats up 20 volts, okay? So that's how you do, that's how you use that. So use this in calculating all sorts of things, especially if you need a resistor, you can use these parameters to figure out what size resistor you'll need, okay? And volts equals current times resistance. The way to think about that is, again, think back to our water hose, okay? If I have a current flowing, now let's say that it's got enough voltage on it to come out to here, okay? But what I really want to do is hit Tabor, all right? So how would I get this, this current all the way over there? Has anyone not shot their brother across? Yes? Oh, adding resistance. Yeah, how do I do that with the hose? Making it small. Yeah, so I put my finger over it, and then, then I can hit it. So if I put my finger over it, I'm decreasing the size of that pipe, which is increasing resistance. So if I increase resistance with the same current flow, then that will increase the voltage, okay? And then I'll be able to hit them. All right. So, um, however, usually in a circuit, so that's if you have a fixed current. Usually in a circuit, you have a fixed voltage rather than a fixed current. But that's how to think about it. All right, so the wiring rule says that all of these points are considered equal, okay? So the wires, you basically think of all wires as really being zero length. Okay, that's basically what this means. All these wires are all zero length, and you just imagine that this whole thing is collapsed together into one area. Because right? for, for the circuits we're working on, it's not going to matter. There is, you know, 
your wires do have resistance, they do have length, and the length can matter, but not in the stuff we're working on. So the way that we think about it, we just imagine that these wires don't exist per se, and these are all collapsed, so they're all wired together right at this point. So all of these circuits are equal, right? We've just drawn them differently, okay? So all three of these circuits are exactly the same, we've just drawn them differently, okay? And so that's, and so when you're, especially when you're writing schematics, the most important thing is to lay things out so that people realize what you're doing, okay? Um, and uh, so you can draw the wire as long as you need, um, and it doesn't matter. And even when we're doing circuits, we can use a wire as long as we need, and it doesn't matter. Okay, so now we've understood some schematics. We understood a little something about electricity. So now what we need to do is learn how to convert a schematic to a breadboard. Okay, so that's what we're going to do next. We're going to convert schematics to solderless breadboards. Okay. Now, sawdust breadboards are amazing inventions. They're very simple devices, but they're awesome. <clears throat> they allow you to put together and take apart circuits without making any permanent attachments. So if you thought about electronics was about soldering stuff together, you don't have to. You can, but you don't have to. Breadboards take care of that. A solderless breadboard, they are pre-wired. So you actually make connections by plugging things in next to each other. Okay, so here's what it looks like. All right, so this is our breadboard, all right? So you see that it's divided in half, and so you have these strips along here. These are called terminal strips, okay? And so each terminal strip, there's a wire behind it that's connecting all of these together, okay? So if I plug two things in on the same half row, that means they're connected together by a wire, okay? And as I said, because of the wiring rule, it doesn't matter which side I plug it, each one in on. I can plug it here, here, or I can swap them and do here and here. It doesn't matter. As long as they're both plugged in to the same strip, I can plug them far away from each other or next to each other. doesn't matter. If they're on the same terminal strip, they are connected. Okay? Um, so these two are disconnected. This is disconnected from this. This bridge is a doubt you shall not pass type bridge. Okay? So that's, that's this part of the board. And then you have what's called power rails. Okay? And there's nothing special about power rails. They're, they're wired exactly like the others. The only difference is that they go all the way down the length of the board. Okay? And, they, are, and they, ha they usually have color on them to indicate which, uh, uh, which uh, whether it should carry positive or negative. Okay? And there's nothing, there's nothing in the wiring that forces that. You could, you could wire it backwards if you wanted to. It's just there to help you remember what your wires are for. Okay, so as I said, all through your project, you usually need access to your positive and negative voltage. So this gives you access all the way down the strip. So you just plug in your battery here, and it powers the whole strip up. And then anytime I need positive, I just wire from positive to wherever I need it. Anytime I need a negative, I wire from negative to wherever I need it. Okay? And so now one thing, these, these strips are not connected to each other. So now if you wanted to connect it, you just wire positive to positive, and negative to negative, and now that's energized these as well, okay? So, um, but you can also use it like, if you have some things that require nine volts and some things that require five volts, you can wire them with different voltages. So however you wanna work it, this is just a super simple device that works however, uh, that, you know, it's wired how it is and you use it how you want. The other thing nice about this bridge is that if you have a chip, if you have a microchip, they just lay right across that. And that will prevent their legs are not connected because of the bridge. But it allows you to connect anything to it because of the terminal strips. Okay. Um, <clears throat> any questions on that? All right, so here's a super simple example. Here is our um, schematic. And here is how we wire up on the breadboard. So notice we connected the red is positive. That's just, I, I always, when I'm connecting my wires, anything that's directly connected to the positive voltage, I, I do in red, and anything directly connected to the negative voltage, I do in black. So this positively ch charges this entire row right here. This positively charges, or negatively charges, 
uh, this entire strip. Okay, so what is this? We have 9 volt positive connected to our resistor. All right, so we take a wire from 9 volt positive and connect it here. Okay, well that means that it's connected to this entire strip. So we can plug in this resistor anywhere along here and it's connected. So we plug it in there, plug the other leg in here. So now what's on the other side of this resistor? The other side of this resistor is our LED. So we plug the LED in and I put it in right next to it, but it doesn't matter where along this strip I plug it in as long as it's somewhere. So also, just on the LEDs, the longer leg is the positive side. Um, so then the negative side is over here. I have to wire that back to negative. Does that make sense? All right. So it's kind of the general steps. We connect our power rails. If, we're, if we were using power rails on both sides, we'd, we'd connect them up positive to positive, negative to negative. Um, then we place components on the board so that they're connected up. Um, let's see here. And, and we use jumper wires to connect. So if they're, if they're very close to each other, we can just wire them directly like here. But if they're far away, we can use jumper wires to connect things that are far apart. All right. And um, I, did, I did one over here. Um, let's see here. So this... Okay, so let's see if I can get that in. All right, so here's my battery connection. And so notice my reds and my red to red, black to blue. So this this side is positive. This side is positive. I have trouble pointing on this. So the red side is positive and the blue side is negative. Okay, and this one has a button in it. So um, so the uh, if you notice. The, the red goes to the resistor. The other side of the resistor is the button. The other side of the button, um, wait. Yeah, the other side of the button is the LED, although it's kind of hard to see there. It almost looks like the, the wire is connected to the button, but it's not. It's actually in the next row. Let me see if I can turn this. So <clears throat> the so the leg, the long leg of the LED is actually in the same row as the button, and the short leg is in the same is in the same row as the wire. And the wire comes back to negative. So if I plug this in, if I push the button, it lights up. Just like magic. All right, so that's the basics, okay? So now what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna teach you five essential circuits. And only four of them are actually essential. The other one just pops up a lot, so I thought I'd explain what it is. Oh, I need to Switch back. Okay, so five essential circuits. This first one you will find everywhere. And that is the voltage divider. Okay? Uh, a voltage divider does exactly what it says. It divides voltage. If I have, so um, this chip right here operates between, I think it's, uh, I want to say it's one and a half to five volts. Okay? But I oftentimes want to operate it from a 9-volt battery. Okay, Well, it, that's outside its operating range, but I can use a voltage divider to take my 9 volts and divide it out so I can have a 4.5-volt input. Okay, And so a voltage divider um, happens anytime you have two resistors and you pull a wire out from the middle. Okay, And the way that, that you can calculate how much voltage is used up is by taking the relative resistances of the resistors, and that's the relative amount of voltages that this takes up. So this, this is six volts positive. Right? Remember, this is just another symbol for negative. So that means between here and here must be six volts. And that's what that means to have a six volt battery. Between, from, from, the, from the positive terminal to the negative terminal is six volts. Okay? So this is 1,000 ohms. This is 2,000 ohms. So all together, we have 3,000 ohms. So one-third of that is in this resistor, and two-thirds of that is in this resistor. So that means that if I've got 6 volts, one-third of it is gone 
by the time I get here, and the other two thirds is gone right there. So that means the output from that is four volts. Okay, so if I if I needed to power something at four volts, I could pull this wire out and power it at four volts. Now, um, that just deals with the relative resistances of the resistors. Um, there's some other considerations. Uh, basically, this can shift a little bit depending on how much resistance is in here. Um, and basically, the, the considerations are the, the higher value resistors you have here, the less current you waste. But it means your output voltage may vary more. Okay? If you have low value resistors here, then you waste a lot of current, but you have a pretty stiff voltage coming out. Okay? Um, so you can use voltage dividers for all sorts of things. Uh, the simplest one is what I said is that if I have a four volt component and I have nine volts coming in, I can divide it out and get the right voltage. But also useful is that a lot of sensors are entirely based on resistance, that different things resist at different, at different rates, at different, uh, so like if you have a temperature sensor, that, that will probably be a resistive element that resists differently at different temperatures. Um, and so what you can do, you can't read that directly because there's nothing that just gives you the output as resistance. You need to convert the resistance to a voltage. And the way you do that is you connect it with a fixed resistor, and then the change in, resi in, in variable resistance versus fixed resistance will give you a change in output voltage. And then you measure that output voltage. Okay? So that having the, having the uh, sensor will vary one of these quantities, and that will vary the ratio, and that will vary the voltage. And voltage is something that most processors can read. Um, so anytime you see a, a circuit that has two resistors and a wire sticking out of the middle, it is probably a voltage divider. Another important circuit is a pull-down resistor, and this is especially important in digital circuits. Because what will happen is, on our Arduino, normally we think about current running into something. Okay? And that, that's true, it does happen, but on your Arduino, these input pins, you should think of them not as eating current. They eat a little bit, but they don't really eat current. What they do is they sense voltage more than they eat current. So what happens is that, it, so let's say I push down this button. Well, that will make this whole area of wire positive. Okay? Now let's pretend I don't have this resistor. Okay? And let's say I let go of the button. Well, what happens? Well, the, since the Arduino is not eating my current, then it's staying positive. It's holding on to its positive voltage, even though there's nothing supplying it because there's nothing eating it either. And so what this resistor does is it provides a path for current to flow out of the circuit once someone lets go of the button. Okay, So you put kind of a hefty resistor there so that it doesn't so you don't waste current out, um, out just from pushing the button, but it's, it, having the resistor there allows the voltage to bleed off once you, once you let go of the button. It's very important on digital circuits, a pull down resistor, okay? Um, another important one is a current limiting resistor, okay? And what a current limiting resistor does um, is it basically does exactly what it says. It limits current. So remember, What's Ohm's law? Volts equals current times resistance. Well, if you have a fixed voltage, then the more resistance we have, the less current we'll have. Okay? Now, so LEDs do not have any real resistance to them. Okay? Um, what they have is just a basic voltage drop. So usually two volts. So let's pretend this is just a wire and not a resistor. Okay? So we have nine volts coming through here. It goes through the LED, now what do we have? Seven volts, okay, because it's got a voltage drop of two volts. Now, so that means that there's no, so there's no resistor on the circuit. So we have seven volts and no resistance. So if we look at our current equation, I equals V divided by R, well we have seven divided by zero. So this is going to draw infinite current. 
which isn't very good for your circuits. Uh, it's not actually infinity. Um, the batteries will max out far, be far before that. But nonetheless, it's not good. If you don't have a resistor on here, um, it will draw as much current as possible from that battery. And on top of that, your LED's max current is 20 milliamps. So um, it will blow out. You will lose that LED and have to throw it away. Um, so what you, what you do is you put a resistor in series um, to limit that current. And so you can calculate it very easily, again, using Ohm's law. So um, you say, well, okay, so the voltage through the resistor is going to be 7 volts because we're losing 2 here, so that means the rest of it's going through the res resistor. Okay. So Ohm's law, current equals volts divided by resistance. So let's say we put a 1K resistor in there. Well, if I take volts, which is 7, divided by 1,000, I get 0.07 amps, which is 7 milliamps. And so I know that that is a safe value for that resistor. Okay, And so that's, that's how that works. Current limiting resistor, Ohm's law, all works together. Okay, So you'll find a lot of current res limiting resistors um, in your applications. Um, let's see here. And then the last circuit, um, probably, I think this might be more confusing than necessary, but this is called a flyback diode. And this is, if you ever see motor controls, you might see a, a diode wired the wrong way. And just know that that's a protection. It's not a, it, it's not doing anything funny except protecting some circuits. Um, and then the last one is a pull-up resistor. And this is the opposite of a pull-down resistor. And so what this does is if you think, you know, normally we think about push a button and things go on, right? Let's say if we want to have push a button and something goes off instead. Well, you, what you use is you use a pull-up resistor. And so what this does, so I have 5 volts, and I have this resistor, and I've got my Arduino pin. Well, this, so since my 5 volts is always connected, this is going to always show positive when the switch is off. Okay? But when someone turns the switch on, this is the path of least resistance for the current. So the current is going to flow this way rather than that way, and it's going to turn it negative. Okay? So a, a, a pull-up resistor kind of inverts the way that a pin works. Okay? Um, it al it's also used for other things. There are certain devices which can only take current, they can't give it. And you can also use a pull-up resistor for those. Um, but basically, if you have a device, you have a resistor coming from the voltage source, and then an output, that's usually a pull-up resistor. All right, so now we want to build a project with our Arduino. Okay, so we will start by connecting, or I'll just take one of these apart. I'm going to take it all the way apart. It's somewhat apart. All right. All right. So here's our breadboard. Here is our Arduino. Okay. Now. The nice thing about Arduino projects is the Arduino actually supplies the power. So the first thing we do is we connect power to the breadboard. Now notice there's a section of pins labeled power, and you can't really read them on this camera, but this is VN, you don't want that. This is ground, so that's a negative. That's also ground, that's negative. All ones that are labeled G and D, those are all ground pins and those are all tied together. So you can use any one of those. And this one says 5V. You can't actually see that here. That's the one we want. So we will connect. That is our positive voltage source. So we will put 5 volts in, and we will connect it to our power, our positive rail. Okay, and we can connect it anywhere in there. Remember our wiring rule. It doesn't matter where along the wire we connect it as long as it's connected. So the next one is ground. Right? And so we'll take one of the... Actually, Take one of these G and D pins. Um, and we'll connect this to negative. Okay? So we've got a 
You get 5 volts to positive, G and D to negative. All right? So then um, what we're going to do is uh, um, we want to have it trigger an LED. So we'll take an LED. and uh, So the long leg is the positive side. Okay, so we put that on our board. So with the long leg being kind of towards the top. That's right. Okay. And so we need a resistor to limit the current in the circuit. It's going to be this guy. Put one leg on the negative, one leg to a different area, and then I'm going to connect. Um, I've got two connections from that. I need to connect the other side of this resistor. Goes back to ground or negative. So that side of the resistor goes to the ground. And then the, the LED, it's going to be turned on by the Arduino. So I'm going to have that green wire goes to the positive pin. And the other side of it, let's see, what do I have this on? Pin. Uh, pin LEDs on pin two. So I'm gonna put the LED on pin number two. Okay, and so that means that anytime in my Arduino code I turn on pin two, if I say digital write pin two high, that's gonna send the current out here. It's gonna go into the positive leg of my LED and turn it on. It's going to have its current limited by this resistor, and it's going to go back to negative. Does that make sense to everyone? Is yeah. there any reason to actually have the positive rail hooked up at this point? Uh, no, not at this point. Okay. It's just I, I always do it. because you're sure. Otherwise, you're going to forget. All right. Um, so this is this is super simple. Um, let's see. And then I'll also, I'll also wire up a button. Okay. Should you not have the resistor first? It doesn't matter. Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, the current will be limited either way. Um, Have you ever uh, used the 3.3 volts? Uh, I, I, right about the five? Yeah. Um, so 3.3 volts, there's a lot of components that operate at 3.3 volts. And um, I, I rarely use them. Uh, I, usually, I usually use this for teaching, so mm -hmm. I rarely have an, an actual reason to use it. But uh, you actually get a lot more efficient components that operate at 3.3 volts regularly. Um, and it uses a lot less power. So it's a... So that's that's this guy right here. So I, I plugged in the five volt connector, but this next one is three point three volts. So um, that's here. So let's let's wire up a button, and a button will actually use positive, right? Because what we're going to do, and this button will will attach to pin three. But where does where does the button get its buttonness from? And that is from having power. It gives power when it's pushed. So Notice the button's got two legs on it. So I'll make sure that those are wired across different rows. Okay. Now I'm going to pull power from this side and stick it into the button. Okay, that powers the button. The other side of it is going to have two different pieces. Uh, one of it is going to be a resistor. This is my pull-down resistor. And this is on the other side of the button, and I'm just going to wire that guy straight to ground. All right. So this, that's my pull-down resistor, and it's it's wired to ground. And make sure that this next wire goes back negative once uh, once the button is pushed. So. It's in the same row. I'm going to wire this guy into pin three. All right. So let's trace this real quick. You've got power going to the button. So normally the button's off, so this doesn't go anywhere. It just stops. When someone pushes the button down, power flows through here, and it goes through this wire to pin three on my Arduino. And if I have that set to input, I can read it. Now as soon as I, so 
There's also power going through here, but not very much because it's a high value resistor. Now, as soon as I let go, um, this, this is still positive, but the rema what's remaining will drain out to negative through this resistor. If I didn't have that resistor, this wire would stay positive even after I let go of the button. Okay? Um, and in fact, it might even flip, flip and flop back and forth like a little ghost. So anyway, so that's a, that's a very important resistor right there. All right, so now we're going to do the same button turns on light, except now we're going to program it with the Arduino. Okay, so go back to my laptop. Okay, so um, so the Arduino IDE. This is uh, this is how you program Arduino's. It's based on Java, so it runs on Windows, Mac, and Linux. Um, you have a single C++ file called a sketch, um, and there's two par parts of it. There's the it's got a setup function where you tell it wh what your input and output pins are because most of the pins can be used for either. So I say pin mode two output, pin mode three input. Um, and then it has a loop function. It runs this over and over and over again as long as there's power. Okay. Um, so um, the, this will automatically uh, link everything together, automatically upload it to your Arduino board. Um, you can hit your check, the, if you hit the check mark, it'll compile it, make sure there's no compilers. You hit the arrow button, and it'll send it to your Arduino, okay? Um, and so the steps are, we're going to connect our Arduino to our USB, type in our program, hit the check mark to compile, and hit the right arrow to upload. And here is the code we're going to use. So setup, pin mode is the function that tells it what to do. So pin 2 is our output pin. Pin 3 is our input pin. Okay, if you set these wrong, you can actually damage your board. Um, it's kind of a long story, but it did, if you think about Ohm's law long enough, you'll, you'll figure it out. Um, so then loop is what we're going to do. And so what we're going to do is we're going to say digital read. So we're going to ask the Arduino what the state of pin 3 is. If it's high, we're going to write, we're going to write our output pin to be high. So if the button's pushed, we're going to turn the LED on. Otherwise, we're going to turn the LED off. Okay? And so this is just going to cycle over and over and over again. And probably maybe um, a million times a second. Okay? And it's just going to say, is the button pushed? Yes, it is. Make sure pin 2 is still high. Oh, button 2 is not, or, or pin 3 is not pressed. Make sure output 2 is turned off. Okay? So here's a slightly different, um, slightly different version of the program you can use. Um, so this will blink the R, will blink the LED uh, when the button is pushed, and so this is exactly the same. But if if we read it high, it'll turn LED two on, and then it will delay for 500 milliseconds. That's half a second, um, and then it'll turn the LED off and delay for half a second. So that way, as long as the button's pushed, it'll be blinking on and off and on and off. But as soon as you let go of it, it'll just turn the LED off, and that'll be all it does. Now, the problem with this code, um, as it's written, is that delay, the delay function that we use there to, to do the blink, pauses the whole Arduino. It, it can't process any changes. It can't look at output, look at inputs or process outputs. Uh, and that's fine for simple projects, but for complicated ones, it's pretty terrible. Okay? In fact, um, in general, the, the way that Arduinos are, are built to be programmed, um, where you have to treat, keep track of your program state, you have to keep track of the um, different delays, you have to keep track of the button state, and you have to keep track of all of it in that single loop function, can get very tricky very fast. Uh, it gets even more complicated because buttons, we think of buttons as just you push it or you don't push it. But buttons actually, if you at the very... Um, you know, when, when they're going, when you're sampling them very fast, when you first push that button, it kind of uh, bounces a little, okay? So you, you kind of, it makes contact, breaks contact, makes contact, break, breaks contact. Well, you don't want that to register as like three button pushes. So you have to do what's called debouncing to prevent that from, from happening, okay? And if, if you have to write uh, debounce code for, you know, five different inputs, 
and you have to collect it all together, it can make standard Arduino programming very difficult very fast, where you as the programmer are dealing with physics rather than logic. And, uh, you know, as, as a computer programmer who grew up on the software side, um, that's difficult for me. So what I like to do instead is use event-based programming. And event-based programming um, abstracts the Arduino so we can respond to logical events rather than physical ones. So we remove the standard Arduino loop and replace it with an event manager. And there are several libraries that do that, um, but I built one that I really like, and I called it Eventually. And you can find it by going to the Arduino Library Manager. And you just go to the, the Sketch menu, go to Include Library and Manage Libraries, and you can search for Eventually and load it there. Event-based programming is actually slightly harder for small programs, like the example one we're doing, but it's a lot easier for larger programs. The event library also uses up about 2K of memory, which um, isn't a problem on Arduinos, but on ATtiny, that's about a quarter of its memory. So if you, if you use some of the smaller chips, you can actually start bumping into space issues. Um, so here is a, a, a program that uses... Uh, my event manager library. Okay, and so what it does is uh, first it, it includes the eventually library, it declares an event manager, um, and it sets the blink state. Now in our setup function, in, this, in addition to uh, setting the pins to be input and output, we also call this function start blink. And what it will do is it will, so the first thing in there it says reset context. That tells it to forget anything that it's currently watching for and just be ready for getting new things. Then it calls the function add listener, and it gets a pin listener that tells it to listen for events, and there it says pin three, and then it when when it gets a signal on pin three, then it's supposed to run the action stop blink. Okay? And then it adds another listener. Um and this is a time listener. And so this, what this says is, is add a time listener that every 500 milliseconds run the function blink light. Okay. And so it's, uh, th so the true value there says to run it over and over and over again and not just one time after 500 milliseconds and stop. So every 500 milliseconds, it'll run the function blink, blink light. Okay. So that's our setup code, is that not only did we set up our pins, we also set up our context, our, our event manager, okay? And we added these listeners. And so now, there, now you'll notice in this code there is no loop function, and that's because the eventually library manages the loop. So instead of, uh, um, so what will happen now is that when, when it senses a signal on pin 3, it'll run the stop blink function. So you go over here and look at the stop blink function. What does it do? Well, first of all, it resets the context, which means it gets rid of all the listeners that are currently in there. And it adds a new listener for on pin 3 to start blink. So it'll so if you push it once, it'll start blinking. If you push it again, it'll stop blinking. Okay, and this pin listener abstracts all of the the interesting things about pins. You don't have to debounce them. You don't have to double check to make sure someone didn't hold the pin down. You don't have to check any of that. The library takes care of all that for you. All you have to do is add the listener. Okay. The other listener, again, is blink light. And that runs the, you, you'll see that function at the top right, uh, blink light. And basically it looks at the global variable blink state and it sets it to whatever the opposite of it is. If it's true, it sets it to false. If it's false, it sets it to true. And it writes that output to pin two. And that's all it does. Now you notice these return true or false. Um, for simple programs like this, you don't have really have to worry about it. Um, it. Those are basically whether or not it should continue processing the current event chain. Um, but as I said, for simple programs, it doesn't even matter. All right, so we've gone over basically how to wire up um, an Arduino and how to put a simple program to it. Um, so the next thing that in your learning journey to do is to learn about different components and how they work. Now we're not going to go into any of these in, in any depth at all here, but I just wanted to kind of familiarize you with some of the basic things that are out there so you can know what to look for. So the basic components we already talked about um, are, are, are the battery, the resistor, the capacitor, LED, buttons, and switches. 
Okay, so those you should be familiar with by now. Um, other things are the diode. Diodes allow current flow in one direction only. We've done LEDs, which are diodes that also emit light. Um, and we also did the flyback diode, which, um, but, but we haven't explored all the depths of what you can do with diodes. Uh, transistors are kind of mini amplifiers or mini switches that allow you to control a large amount of current with a small amount of current. So we talked about that a little bit with motors, that um, you know the Arduino doesn't have a lot of current coming out of its pins, or it shouldn't, um, but you can use a transistor to use a little bit of current to control a lot of current somewhere else. Uh, Zener diodes are used to regulate voltage. Transformers are used to change voltages up and down. We rarely use those. Inductors store small amounts of current. Uh, those are usually used in radio applications. Um, and then relays, again, we don't use those very often, but they, those are electromechanical switches. Um, also, though, there's integrated circuits that are available. And that's basically a collection. An integrated circuit is a chip that's a collection of, of uh, transistors that do some function for you. Okay, so um, these are some ones that um, Arduino enthusiasts tend to migrate to. Uh, the LM339 or the smaller LM393 are voltage comparators. You can use to, uh, if it'll compare two voltages and output either a, a high or low signal. Uh, the NE555 timer um, can either be a delay timer, it can be an oscillator. So if you need some sort of vibrational frequency or something, you can use a timer for that. Um, the 74HC595, it's what's called a shift register. So if I'm running out of pins on my Arduino, I can use a shift register to output many pins using just a couple pins on my Arduino. And the 74HC165 is very similar, except it's used for inputs rather than outputs. Um, the 74HC14 is a Schmidt trigger, and what it does is it simply inverts a signal, but it also cleans it up. So, um, you know, there's several, you know, uh, as I said, high voltage is usually around 5 volts, and a low voltage is around 0 volts. But, you know, sometimes there are, um, you know, sometimes if you might have a situation where you're only getting 4 volts or 3 volts, and you need to move it all the way to one side or the other. And so the Schmidt trigger will do that. Um, if you, uh, but it also uh, Schmidt trigger inverts the signal. So if you want it back, just the original signal clean, you just do two of them in a row. Uh, op amps are popular for audio amplification. Um, the CD4011 uh, is a NAND logic gate. So um, if you're trying to do digital logic, um, the 74HC373 is a is a latch which stores a single bit. Um, the LM2917 is a frequency to voltage converter, so you can, uh, if, if for some reason you need to measure how often uh, something happens, you can convert that to a voltage that's then easy to read. Um, the 74HC163 is a 4-bit counter if you need to use to do any counters outside of the Arduino. Um, and I notice some of these are the 74HCs and some of them are prefix CD. Um, there's not a lot of difference between those, except there used to be um, a heavy distinction between what were called CMOS circuits and uh, TTL circuits. And the TTL circuits basically gave a high of 5 volts and a low of 0 volts. And the CMOS gave a high of uh, around uh, 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 3.5 volts and a low of 0 volts. And um, so they don't all they, they didn't used to play nicely together, but they've kind of adjusted the ranges so that you can um, the CMOS outputs the 3.3 volts still uh, registers as a true value on TTL inputs. So it's the the differences between them have decreased a lot. Um, in some applications, it's important, but um, basically what you should do is you should read the data sheets and pinouts and find tutorials on the web that tell you how to use these. Uh, always remember if you're buying chips to make sure that they are DIP, which stands for dual inline package. That's where you have the two rows of pins coming down that allows you to plug it into your breadboard. Um, and so anyway, just, just you know, if, if you have a need for something like that, just consult the list and see if there's 
something on there that matches your need, and if not, ask in, in a forum and see what's available. And then you have kind of uh, more macro scale components. Um, you have, on, for Arduinos, they have motors, servos, controllers for motors, um, all sorts of things. Um, if you want to connect to Bluetooth, uh, the HM10 is a great little chip. Um, be careful because there's a there's a Chinese clone that works works great, but it has a slightly different way of communicating with it, and they're both oftentimes called the same thing. There's the ESP8266 um, Wi-Fi module. Um, there's an Ethernet module, an SD card module, a motion detector module, temperature sensors, accelerometers, distance sensors, touch screens. Yes, it's a real touch screen. Um, photo resistors, flex sensors, real-time clocks, and many, many others. Um, there's just so many components out there, it's, it's hard to list them all. You basically just need to, if, if you have one you're interested in, um, I would I would buy the component if it doesn't cost too much and see what you can do with it. Um, you might wind up uh, blowing out one or two before you get the hang of it, um, but that comes with the territory. So anyway, uh, thank you for this tutorial, and hopefully this gets you started in the world of Arduino development.